Okay, so I am live here at I was I need to drink more today because yesterday I was like, uh, Taylor Keo Health's uh, retreat here in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. And I'm so privileged to be no. here to oh. give the no, first presentation. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let you all join in. It's really just a going to be a Q&A. So get your questions ready just to have a discussion. I'm just going to start off with some words that I find very powerful. And through my journey, it's it's been a very everybody's everybody struggles and everybody goes through their their path to try to get to optimal health but um, just as a quick background in case some of you don't know me i've been an optometric physician for over 32 years i've been carnivore this march will be 15 years and so um i feel like you know, I, i'm in a i'm in a really wonderful spot in my life because I, I have some, let's just say, um, medical credibility, being um, having been in the medical field for so long, and having the experience that I do, having come to this way of eating, um, I hope to be able to, through everything that I do, motivate and inspire people. I really feel that through, I, I myself suffered for a long time with binge eating, carb, sugar, processed food addiction to the nth degree and suffered so long that I at, at one point thought this is going to take me down and just kept seeking and searching and, and mind you I was a physician through part of this too and was so fortunate to come upon back in 2009 Charles Washington zeroing in on health forum and I just was riveted just reading through people's journals and things that were reversing for them and things that all of a sudden they were astonished that they were told the wrong information about what to eat and what not to eat and how so many things were improving in their lives. And I just said, oh my gosh, let's jump in. I don't know, this sounds kind of crazy, <laughs> really crazy, but let's just go for it because there was um, a, a few women in there who were in their journals that everybody could read. Uh, this is way before Facebook and Instagram and all that. So this is just some, you know, very solo independent journal. And I saw that they were relieved of their cravings and of their addiction. And I said, well, I'm all in, I'm going to, be my own experiment. I will continue to research. We shared different documents like uh, Not by Bread Alone, um, The Fat of the Land, all the Villamar Stephenson studies. And it was just a great community. And it was a great group of people, like minded people, who were striving, like I was, for better health. And I, you know, I'm still so grateful to this day to have myself persevered enough to continue, oh my gosh, <laughs> that, that forever web surfing. Um, you know, back in the day, that's all we had was just surfing the web. It wasn't putting a certain little search item in, in YouTube and finding 500 videos to, to watch. It was really just trying to get through anything and everything to seek an answer. So, I feel at this point because I felt so I, I felt so much that that community was key to my success. It was so key because you we feel so alone doing this weird thing and I call it flying the freak flag because that's what it feels like, you know, we are just um, you know, on a ship out in the ocean by ourselves pretty much. But now, I have to say, here it has so evolved from what I dealt with 15 years ago. As you can imagine, this was really, really freakish back then. And so I'm like, I, I was so happy when I started in to look at social media. I was like, oh look, cool, somebody has a little carnivore thing, let me check it out. And then somebody would comment on this person's thing and said, oh well that's great, but 
It's not sustainable. It can't be healthy long term. Not sustainable. And I was sitting there going, ah, wait, there I am. It is. And then so I made this carnivore doctor account, and that was the start of it. And before I knew it, you know, within a few months, I had 5,000 followers. And I just kept wanting to share my story. I don't have scurvy. I feel great. My hair's not falling out. You know, everything that there's, oh, you're gonna have diarrhea for the rest of your life. No, I'm fine, really. <laughs> so it was really important for me, I felt at that point, just to be a voice of, because I saw how much it helped and healed people. I didn't want anybody to get discouraged. I was like, damn it, don't tell them. It's not sustainable, it is. You know, I was like, this has changed my life. And through the beginning of it, I wanted to shout this from the rooftops. Once I really like hooked into it, I was like six months in and I was like, whoa, okay. Not only is this not like gonna be unhealthy for me, but it's incredible. And it's incredible for this person and that person and that person that I'm reading online. And I said, this is really something that has to be heard and so I pretty much have in a in a very interesting way just continued as best I can to motivate and inspire as many as I can based on my journey and I try to help my patients in my exam chair and you know I get diabetics and I have people with so many autoimmune issues and I'm like I know this sounds crazy but um, hear me out <laughs> and you know a lot of people don't want to hear anything they really don't and so that's that's part of what I, I get into also with um, <coughs> with probably all of our journeys is wanting to help loved ones once you find for yourself that and, and you go down the rabbit hole <laughs> enough rabbit holes in this whole thing and you're like wow 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 and then you want it for you want it for everybody that's in your life. You know, you want them to wake up to the fact that you really are committing slow suicide by continuing to eat those French fries that are on your plate. I can't even watch you eat them because I know that those seed oils stay in your body for six to eight years. Don't go. Okay, zip it up, Lisa. Nobody wants to hear. Nobody wants to hear anything about that. So people have to really be open and willing and at their own point where they have their own personal why that makes them cry. Um, so I, um, I'm just going to read here um, something that I feel is just very powerful to listen to. If you want to feel good, you and only you are responsible for taking the necessary action to start down the road of feeling better one day at a time. No one can want it and will it into existence for you. Believe me, I've tried. My parents did not want to listen to me. As badly as my, you know, my brother and my parents, all diabetic, obese, as badly as I wanted their, them to want this knowledge, you can't want it or will it in anybody. And I'm sure that we've all had experiences with that. And you could say, well, we just gotta lead by example. I kept trying to lead by example for 14 years now and it's still so difficult. And you know, I mean, I'll come back to this because in my life, my experience, my impression, this is a very, very, very serious, real addiction. There is an incredible drive to keep eating the foods that we know are not good for us and we do it anyway, okay? and. The, the, the unfortunate thing is that for, let's say, the average people out there laughing and celebrating and socializing with all of this toxic junk food, they don't realize it because they haven't, I don't want to say hit rock bottom, they don't have their own personal why. And Charles Washington, my original guru, OG mentor, I loved his one saying, saying back then was, the lucky ones get fat. Because not everybody, um, their, their body doesn't get inflamed and ill in the same way. And in some people, it hits the insulin issue and the obesity issue comes on. And other people, you might not be overweight at all, but you could be diabetic, you could have cancer, you could have heart disease, hypertension, right? All these other things. So 
it was so interesting that he said the lucky ones get fat because then you're wearing your addiction and there's that that feeling of I know I, I could feel better and be better and do better and I'd be able to do so much more if I just didn't have all this weight so there's that ongoing drive in, in aside from you know vanity wise but to want to be at a lean healthy body weight so it was interesting that he would say that the lucky ones were fat because those were typically the ones that were seeking this out. Boy, did I go on a tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> so you, and only you, you have to take responsibility and know that no one is coming to save you. <laughs> I hate yeah. to be the bearer of bad news. Nobody cares, nobody's coming. It's mm -hmm. you, yourself, right? Me, myself, and I. You have to take that responsibility and, and really, really internalize the fact no one's coming to save you. It's you. Stop making all of the excuses that are only hurting you at the end of the day. Nothing good in life comes easily, but trust me when I say that you, being your healthiest, happiest self, is worth more than anything else in this world. Because mm -hmm. we know without our health, we have nothing. And it's worth it, because every ounce of hard work that it takes to get there is just so worth it. I really, I feel, honored to be able to help so many on their journeys because I realize what an integral part, let's say somebody like Charles Washington was to me, that I am honored to be for anybody else who, <laughs> who wants to come and listen to me say, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> because I do, you know, I'll say, I deliver tough love. I also deliver compassion and support, but I want everybody to start thinking about the excuses that you make for yourselves mm -hmm. and try to really understand the reason why. This is so difficult. I say on top of the physical chemical addiction to these foods, there's that whole other level and a big level of our emotional attachment to food. We eat to fill a void. We eat out of boredom, mm -hmm. out of stress, even out of happiness sometimes. And that relationship with food is another level of the difficulty of just the whole aspect of this being such an addictive um, entity, the food, whether it's if you're a, you know, a chip bread pasta person <laughs> or you're a sugar cookie ice cream person, you know, it doesn't matter. It all is the drive to eat not for satiety and not for hunger, but for all the other wrong reasons. And that's a very difficult thing to really understand, like why am I turning to food and trying to change that relationship with food? It's very difficult. My, like through all of these years, a dozen years now of coaching, I, I feel like one of the most important things is right here, what we have right now community mm -hmm. so for me running my groups is so important because it is that interaction and that feeling I'm not alone mm -hmm. these people get it I was on my meeting last night and we were talking about those of us who have actually thrown food out and not only to be a couple hours later to fetch something out of the damn trash and you know you're in a deep dive at that point and there was people in my group last night who were all shaking our heads, and then they'd come on and they go, oh my gosh, I can't even believe you were talking about this and said this, I've done that too. And it's so humiliating, it's so horribly, um, just debilitating to your, to your own psyche, you know, doing something like that. But to understand how incredibly strong this damn addiction is, and. I will probably be talking about this till the day I die. <laughs> but it is very, very significant, and it is something that is so possible to overcome. So if any of you, and I call it the ditch, and anybody who's been in my groups knows about the ditch demon in here who tries to give you permission to go ahead and just have X, Y, or Z. You can't, you know, 
<laughs> one's too many, a thousand's never enough. And we all know that. And you're just giving your per yourself permission to keep doing the same damn cycle that you've been doing over and over. We've all yo-yoed, okay? We've all been, okay, well now I gotta fast. And then I'm binging. Nope, nope, I'm gonna be good. But good for a little bit, up, oh, face down, because why? Well, didn't want my host to be uncomfortable, so I just had blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, you're off the rails and you're in the ditch again. So that's really my, um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of, just because of my background, I talk about this a lot because this is where I've come from and to help people with their relationship with food, it really has to be where you're, you're in a community of support, you're held accountable a little bit <laughs> because that really does help. And having the daily support with private chat groups in between is really important. Knowing that you could turn to that and reach out and say, oh my gosh, I have to go to a bridal shower and I am freaked out because the last time I went to something like that, I did this, right? And, and talk it out and have the feeling that you have support because this is so hard to go alone. And especially, and that, that's why I go into this with you know, the friends, the family, the coworkers, most of them think you're crazy, okay? Oh, yeah. There's just no way around it. And, you know, people are like, oh, you're still doing that meat eating thing? And I'm like, yeah, and I've never felt better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that can be the end of it. And I tell people, you do not owe anybody an explanation. Just try to keep strong in your community. We've got a great community here. And hopefully, you know, I always say it's like, we're gonna get name tags, we're gonna know where people are from. We're going to be able to keep in touch. You'll make friends. You'll make bonds here, and it could be life changing. Mm -hmm. And it is every life step of the way, everything that you do, every rabbit hole you go down, <laughs> is your journey to keep leveling up. Level up. Everything. Every decision you make every day, you have to keep in mind. Nobody's coming to save you. <laughs> Remember that it's you. So. I, I talk about, uh, I, I have this thing called sober circles because I often will talk about not having sober behavior around certain foods. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, obviously all of the junk's out of the picture, right? So there's no sugar, grains, carbs, seed oils, processed foods, okay? That we know is in the, the red zone. I have a red circle, a yellow circle, and a green circle. So, but even in carnivore foods, and I talk about this in my groups because we bring it up and it's a real thing. Even when you're steadfast, you're like, oh, I've been carnivore for a year now, and well, guess what? That person's binging on pork rinds with sour cream. <laughs> I always tell my story, and you guys will laugh, the ones that know me in my groups, but I always give my example of that ball of fresh mozzarella. Uh, and the ends are got the little line wrinkled from where they twisted it, and then those are the best ones to cut off first. And then I'm going to the next slice in, and then another, and then I'm like, oh, I better wrap this up and put it away. And then it's calling me from the fridge. Come on, you might as well just finish it so you don't have to think about it tomorrow, okay? <laughs> now, these are the kind of things, I don't have sober behavior around cheese, especially warm, heated cheese, fried cheese, okay? <laughs> so I just, I just know that that's in my yellow zone. I allow myself these things only under certain circumstances. Mm. I don't keep them in my house and don't make them on a daily basis. I also, and just for point of reference here too, for another example, I don't have Silver behavior around bacon. If I make a pound of bacon, I might stop at half a pound, but it's still sitting there and I'm gonna pass by and probably have another piece. And then 20 minutes later, I'm gonna smell it and be, I don't know, bored or stressed about something and walk by and grab another piece. I'm not hungry. That's not sober behavior. I'm mm -hmm. eating it because it's salty and it's tasty and it's good. And for some reason, that particular food for me, it's gotta be in the yellow zone. It's not in my green zone. Green zone is meat, seafood, eggs. I don't ever binge on those. So I, in my mind, know what's safe for me and what I need to be cautious about. And those 
cautionary things. I have very specific guidelines on in my head, okay? Um, so once you lay that out, and that's why I, in my groups, I send out the PDF with the worksheets, and you are to write down your green, your yellow, your red, and you are to reevaluate it over time because it will change. Trust me, you will end up booting something from the yellow into the red <laughs> when you realize, even with your little criteria for the yellow, mm, it's not so good, out it goes. And you might just experiment, say, you know what, for the month of November, this is gonna go into my red zone and I'm gonna adjust this. And it's just a way of physically seeing a way to control your out of control behavior and to stay out of the ditch. That's the, the big thing. And if you're going to binge, binge on carnivore, it's okay. It's okay. Have a pound of bacon if that be needed at that point. Mm -hmm. It's okay. And then you're gonna have to reel in and say the next day, all right, wow, I really did eat the whole pound. Let's see, why, what was going on, why, and am I gonna try to set parameters and not let that happen? And only eat bacon at a diner when they only serve me three slices and that's all I get because that's portion control but that's that's really it so um, so that I, I really didn't even actually plan anything because I thought this was going to be a whole Q&A and so I would like to I would love to answer any questions that you have and Emily okay. so speaking of sober behavior and cheese and all this Well, here we go, Emily. It's gonna be different for everybody, okay? You put raw cheese in your yellow circle and you try it, right? Because I can't answer that other than there, there, there definitely is things that I've read that have said that. Uh, I don't know how much access all of us have to full on raw cheese. So to even make that the possibility, I don't know, some of you might live near a farm and say, yeah, I can get all the raw cheese I want, but I got Whole Foods, okay? <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, and, and, and then I'll, I'll flip it to another aspect of the dairy and the cheese is just over time, through a lot of readings, learning, podcasts, listening to scientists and physicians, there's definitely an inflammatory component to much of the dairy that's out there, okay? Aside from the addictive component of the casomorphines, right? And um, there's even some talk and issue and evidence of dairy, if you listen to Sophia Clemens, that it increases prostate cancer, breast cancer, and then that's all I need to do is go, okay, it's in my yellow zone anyway. We should probably boot it into the red. No, don't make me put it in the red. I love cheese. Don't do it. And I'm like, okay, I can have cheese if I'm at a restaurant and it's a bacon cheddar burger. Okay, I can have, so then I have parameters around it because I'm not ready to kick it into the solid red yet. But that, that's really, you know, uh, you, it, it, it's really just continuing to try. I, there's no manual on this. You know, and unfortunately, it's very individual, and you will find out, each of you, very quickly, when you start using that term that I just used, sober behavior. Do I have sober behavior with this? Am I behaving soberly around this right now? And you'll be able to answer it very quickly of your, um, are we reach? so now here's the other thing, you know, the old chip habit, you know, you're watching TV at night and you're reaching into the chip bag, right? Well, the carnivore equivalent is some of my lovely, Tammy is raising her hand, my lovely long-term followers who I love dearly who um, make uh, dehydrated pork loin. They slice it with this awesome, cool little manual slicer and it's paper thin, they salt it, they put it on the dash. It's like potato chips, okay? <laughs> so now, what does Lisa find herself doing? I'm reaching into that dehydrated pork loin potato chip bag repeatedly, right? And then I'm like, what am I doing? I put that back in the fridge. It doesn't have to be refrigerated, but it's back in the fridge. And then I even try to put it in the freezer so that I can say, okay, now it's in the freezer. Well, guess what? It can go right out of the freezer. It tastes great. It really does. <laughs> Cindy. So tell me what you do because we all have social situations. Yes. 
What do you do when your girlfriend said, hey Lisa, you want to come have dinner with us? We're going to have a game night. How do you prepare yourself to go to that? All right, so the question is, on my Instagram live in case they missed it, how do you prepare to go to a social situation where maybe it's a girls' night and it's I don't know, bunko or whatever sometimes happens on those girls' nights and you're pretty sure there's not gonna be sober food for you. Um, yeah, so really the options are you eat ahead of time. I like to do a little of that and a little of I just prepare some nice bacon knots and bring a whole nice basket of bacon knots. It's really popular at these parties. And then you have something to eat. Or, you know, just bring, you know, whatever, sausage cheddar balls. Um, and you can bring a shrimp platter or, you know, bring, bring something that you're just being kind of hospitable, but you know then that that's what you're gonna pick at and eat. And remembering too that with any and all these social situations, whether you're at a wedding, reception, or a bridal shower, or a barbecue picnic, you're there for the people and the interaction. Us people who have been addicted severely to food, our first thought is like looking at the table, what's mm -hmm. here, right? We're just yeah. looking at the food, <laughs> looking what's here, right? But that's why that whole relationship with food needs to change. You walk in, before you even walk in there, you go, I, again, those kind of things, I usually am not arriving hungry. Um, and I have a little discussion with myself going in, you know what, I'm not here for the food. I'm just gonna go find who I haven't seen in a while mm -hmm. and who I'd love to spend time with and talk with. And I, I concentrate on that. Because if I don't, then my other side of me mm -hmm. kicks in and says, oh, wow, ooh, wait, what, Who, what'd you bring? Oh, and it's constantly looking at mm -hmm. the buffet, okay, yeah. So I feel like I've been a professional dieter, okay, because I've tried like all of them, okay. Cabbage soup diet too? Yeah, probably, yeah. I mean, I do like, I do like cabbage soup, so yeah, I think I might have tried that. And I've tried, you know, most of them. I mean, I even worked for Nutrisystem for a while as their behavior counselor. Wow. So I really have been, but I didn't like their food at all. It was gross, but they tried to teach people portion control. But my question to you is, because people will say to me, are you carnivore? And I am today, okay? However, um, I think I was paleo or keto for like, you know, off and on. Or low carb or Atkins. Right, because, so I don't really even, I couldn't tell you the date I decided to eliminate. But my question is, did you just like 14 years ago, did you go from, all these bandwagons to being like a clean carnivore perfect person because <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I follow you and you know I do so I yes yes, yes. yeah well so I my path prior to that's a good question isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is so my my path prior right prior to that evening March 9th 2009 wow. when I came up upon this forum my path was crazy like everybody's, you know, you know, trying everything. And I hit upon paleo. I read the book by Ray Audette called Neanderthin. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. It's like the whole premises of it is if you were on a prairie, deserted island or whatever, <laughs> what would you eat if all you were armed with was a sharp stick? So, you know, you could fish and stab a fish, you could get an animal, you could have an egg, right? You could pick berries, you could, you wouldn't eat potatoes because you can't eat them raw, right? So, but it was basically, you know, I guess you could call it, kind of came down to really more of like a whole foods kind of thing, right? But I quickly determined that I don't have sober behavior around dried apricots or mangoes or pineapple or you name it, right? Mm -hmm. And there went that out the window because then I would start to binge because the sugar and then the, I'd be face down in the ditch again. And then uh, somebody talked about this book called The Schwartzbein Principle. 
And I was like, huh, I'm intrigued because they said, oh yeah, my I and my mother lost blood, all this weight. It's basically no sugar, no flour. You know, that's kind of the, the gist of where that was going. So I got the book, I'm reading the book, and I'm a limit. I'm like, wow, I can't eat bread anymore, okay. And you know, I just kind of kept going and again, was still, you could have nuts and seeds and fruit, and boy, could I binge on nuts. Nuts is like crack cocaine to me, yeah. okay? Oh, yeah. There's no such thing as a, a, a little handful of nuts. It's a bowl, <laughs> the whole bowl. Because by the time I'm finishing the handful, I'm already looking at which nut of the mixed nuts I'm really gonna die for next, right? It's just, it's just perpetual, so that never worked. But so you can see that I kind of was dabbling in. I was like, oh, this works, this is good. and then. And then I'd be down in the ditch again. And so really what it came down to was actually then once, and I, I did Atkins for like a little, I never really actually read the book, but I kind of knew about it. But that was when Atkins, at the point that I found it, was starting to come out with the Atkins bars. Mm -hmm. And then the, the Atkins had, I yeah. think it even had a, um, a like a, a supplement appetite suppressant thing with the mm -hmm. Atkins label on it. It kind of had gotten commercialized at that point. but. Yeah, I, I, I dabbled in that, and that's all well and good until you climb the carb ladder that they promote, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these things were a stepwise on my personal journey. So then at that point when I got to this zeroing in on health thing and zero carb, I was like, oh, wow, this is like all of those on steroids, <laughs> right? This is like the ultimate far end, high end of every little combination of things that I was trying to do, but where'd my fruit go? <laughs> what am I going to do about X, Y, or Z? And, but I was so at that point where I had my why that made me cry mm -hmm. so desperately that just to read in there that someone was relieved of this, that I was so driven. And I'm not going to say it was easy. I mean, there was a point where I was out in the orchard doing the annual nectarine and peach picking with my kids and got home and I was like, and I had a half a peach and then I was like mm, yeah not good because I want three more peaches mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's when I really realized and this was before this was before carb addiction doc Dr. Cywis right this was before you know I had seen Dr. Lustig's thing on sugar and this was before the quit sugar summits that were this was all before that so I'm not even thinking like actual the the addiction part of it but that's why now I, I really just try to, for anybody that this resonates with, get you to understand that this is seriously a real thing. And abstinence is really the key. Because an alcoholic, a heroin addict, they don't shoot up on the weekend. Right. One, uh, it's, it's the holidays, I'm gonna have a drink. Right. This does not happen. So unless you're going to resign yourself to the fact that you're gonna just keep going in and out of that ditch. And typically, addictions worsen over time. So if you thought you were binging on you know, a sleeve of cookies, next thing it's a package of cookies, and next thing you're driving to go get it, and you're sneaking into the car and you're hiding the wrappers. You know, this is like a progression of behaviors that happens with this, and it's just very, very important. Yes? Lisa, there's a lot of people here who are new. What's your best advice? for newcomers, something that just sticks with them that they can, they can carry on through. So the question is, is what advice for new people, since here at the retreat there are some that are probably fairly new, one week, two week, one month, into this whole crazy fly your freak flag thing. So welcome, <laughs> welcome to our crazy world. But yeah, I think the most important thing to, and, and I, I kind of said it before as far as what is going to be repeated is the community and the group aspect of this because trying to do this alone and sitting in your house and then next thing you know somebody um, or you're in your office and somebody so nicely gifts you dark chocolate covered pretzels <laughs> and then you're there by yourself and you're like oh boy <laughs> now what you know it's 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 those kind of moments where unless you have others to bounce it off with accountability where you're meeting with others and being able to talk with others it's so it's so difficult and i hate to 
sound like the bearer of bad news as far as, oh boy, you guys are in for it, but this is going to be, this is the battle of my life. And I say, I still have my shield up and my sword out because there's just no way around it. We are in a society where so much centers around food and so much centers around that bad processed addictive food. And when you think about it, almost every day you're barraged with commercials, right? You're at Home Depot buying a hammer and there's just the latest Reese's Peanut Butter Cups has crushed potato <laughs> chips in it now. Really? Oh my God. Um, and then again, then you're at the break room in your office workplace and oh, Mrs. Smith baked, it's still warm, it's crumb cake, her famous recipe, you have gotta try it. Like, uh, right? It's constant, it's over and over and mm -hmm. over. And it's, everybody's like, where are we going? What are you bringing? What are we having? Think about it. It's food, food, food. Mm -hmm. So that's why our particular, I don't want to pinhole you all into having my addiction, but I'm going to say that probably for, for whatever reasons that we're all here, it's because we have, for most all of our lives, eaten the foods that we were told were okay and healthy and appropriate. Mm -hmm. Even like I had Swanson's Hungry Man TV dinners when I was a kid because <laughs> Of course, that's just what is fine, right? And we were told to have margarine instead of butter. So I was having margarine. So just, yeah, and, and the cereals and the oatmeal and all that stuff. And so just think how many decades, decades we have been inflaming our bodies because this stuff is very, 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 very tricky. It stays in your body a long time. There's like a six to eight year period of time to get those seed oils out. It's wow. so incredibly long, and every cell in our bodies has a lipid membrane, a fat, and when we get this inflammatory stuff in our bodies, it is so important for us to realize that. And, and I, I always hope, just go on and watch some of the videos out there about seed oils and how it was mm -hmm. machine engine oil sludge mm -hmm. that they turned into a food product, okay? Mm -hmm. And it might make you pause the next time you're in front of a Chips Ahoy or whatever that has all these seed oils in it to think how long that is going to take to exit your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. This is fascinating. I, I'm about five months into keto, uh, three carnivore. Um, and I've been discussing with different people here. My why feels very strong. I've, I've got some great health benefits out of it. One was I had severe hip pain that I believe was inflammation and it's gone. I mean, it was so bad, it was waking me up in the middle of the night. So yeah. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> so grateful because uh, it was scaring me a lot. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, and people are bringing this up too, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Is the social aspect of it? Uh, that we're talking about, sort of the, the reaction from people. Um, I can just think, like right off the top of my head, um, last week uh, my boss brought in, you know, donuts basically uh, covered in frosting, and uh, uh, and she was like pushing it on. We we had a morning meeting, and she was like really pushing, and it and. Uh, I think one person took it, took one of the donut. It was a donut hole with and whatever, um, and she started looking angry, like visibly, like she was getting pissed that, like she was taking it personally. Uh, right, she was offended she, at the hospitality she was offering that nobody was graciously receiving. Right, right, and and that's like not the first time, um, yeah. you know, with her and then other people. How do you? I, how do you navigate that? Is that just, you have to just accept that that's her reaction. I don't really have control over her reaction. Just uh, say yes, Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, I, always, I always think that one of the best all around general responses to always keep in your head, always, is when somebody says, oh, you gotta try these donuts, they're so, they're so good. You, say, you know what? I used to love them, but I've realized over time they do not make me feel good. Right. I really do not feel good when I eat them. Right. Okay? That's great. Yeah. So now it puts the onus on them to say, well, I don't 
don't care. I don't care. I don't care how you feel. Right. I don't care how that's a good one. Yeah. So, so once you say that, then they, they, they have to back down because yeah. it would be silly for them. Well, eat it anyway. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, that's really kind of crazy. Um, you know, a lot of the attacks that happen are, at least through my long standing time of this and hearing the very interesting issues people have with me about this, it's like, well, that's all good now, but surely you're, you're, you're aware that it's going to end up in a heart attack, right? Oh, or yeah. what's your cholesterol? Or, you know, yeah. uh, on and on and on, <laughs> all of that, right? So, My cholesterol's good. You know, <laughs> you know, it, you know part, 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 part what I say now is go on YouTube and watch my naysayers video because I have a whole video that I made that is exactly about this. And it goes through different scenarios and what I found through all my years of experience to come back with just to have and and some of my group members it was interesting because they're all like the, the one was heading off to like a family reunion event for a weekend and she's like man I'm, I'm gonna watch your video again right before I go so I've got it all fresh in my head but and, and part of it is you have to remember like at the end of it I say this too is like always remember you don't owe anybody an explanation okay it's not up to you you're not trying to convince them to come on to your opinion, right? And you're not trying to convince them that they're wrong about their opinion yeah. of you. Yeah. So it's a futile kind of exercise. Uh, it's just really ridiculous to think that you're gonna have any sort of positive beneficial conversation. So we just try to end it. Right. And it to me, it's it can be something as simple of, as, yeah, I still I still eat this way, and gosh, I have never felt better. Mm -hmm. How's that vegetarianism working for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, my journey is very similar to yours. I've been meat-based for about four years, but I kind of did it, cutting out processed foods, and it was a journey. I am now at the point, though, where it, how do I, sometimes I don't know how to deal with this constant feeling of, oh my God, I feel so sorry. Like, I feel sorry for, you know, Everybody, because you, the lucky ones get fat, and you see right. somebody get inflamed, and a lot of I'm seeing them younger and yeah, younger the, and younger. So the question is about how really handling in your own psyche, There's knowing, no to feel knowing so yeah. well what will heal people, and looking at the, I don't want to call it the ignorance, but really the just stuff just no knowledge of no it. No knowledge. And they're not at that point where they don't have a severe hip problem. They're not obese. They don't have a cancer diagnosis. They're not going down the rabbit hole seeking. They're just going about eating the way they're eating until those damn seed oils and processed foods and sugars and grains and everything take a toll and either, you know, whatever it's gonna be, arthritis, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, dementia, depression, anxiety, all these things that might end up getting somebody then to their point of the why that makes them cry. But I totally get what you're saying as far as, gosh, and it's it's really bad when you're looking at a family and there's little Especially. five and seven year olds and yes. they're eating the deep fried chicken tender fingers next to the french fries, mm -hmm. okay? And, and in my mind thinking, gosh, oh my gosh, like I just so, wish because if you watch I have a YouTube video with Dr. Chris Kenobi and we went into because he's really an expert on this whole um, the the process of disease in our society with the exponential increase of seed oils and that um, one uh, container of McDonald's french fries you know all that red <laughs> container with those fries you know what I'm talking about yeah. one container of those is um, he said far far worse than a child smoking a pack of cigarettes oh with the acrylamide that's in it. I mean, there's mm. some very interesting statistics that people just don't know. And mm. again, it, it really has to, I actually, in, in response to exactly what you're saying, how, how you get over where you look at something, you just feel so badly, they just don't know, right? But also, you can flip it in a way that's helpful to you and 
let's say I'm at a table of a whole group of people and we're at the dessert course and everybody's passing around the creme brulee and oh, here's the carrot cake and oh, we got key lime, right? And they're passing it all around. And the thought can be, you know what? I am so glad I know better. I feel badly that they don't and that, yeah. but everybody is on their own path and everybody's mm -hmm. free to put in their mouth mm -hmm. what they choose. Mm -hmm. and. We just have to honor the fact that they don't really want to hear from us in our opinion. Right. Sometimes they're like, don't ask Margie about that. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, mom, shut up. Yeah. That's what I get. Yes. Mom, shut up. I have a question. So I have done pretty well with cutting out sugars, and I switched over to a lot of things with stevia. And my question is, so I know that if you're not having glucose, you're not gonna get the glucose spike, and so the insulin won't be you know, pouring out to cover that glucose. So my question is, when you are having things like stevia or stevia, what's happening, what's the mechanism then? Because I still feel like there must be some kind of insulin response or response because it's sweet, but what is the response when the glucose is not rising? Okay, so my first response to you is what is it about that food is do you have sober behavior around that food that has the stevia in it no and what would help me to cut it out <laughs> would be knowing the mechanism okay so you want the science to back out the fact that that stevia sweetened dessert might be mimicking your old favorite of mm -hmm. whatever it is. And you're hoping that the science is gonna prove to you that you really shouldn't have it. I'm just curious. I know, I know, I know. And I'm, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not meaning to be confrontational. No, I'm an addict, I'm, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, so that, this is what, <laughs> this is what I'm, I'm wanting to get at with you is your emotional connection and your really, your your feelings, your emotional connection to that stevia drink or dessert, okay? And that's by far way more important than- But I'm still curious. Yeah, well, so- Does anyone know? Is it not researched? Like, right. Is that the taste buds right? don't know the difference. Right. I understand that, but I still wanna know if the insulin's not getting triggered, what is the negative physiological well, yeah. 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 So, so this is, so go ahead. It is. Yeah, so, so the taste of sweet hits the sweet sensors on your tongue mm -hmm. and your body responds as if sugar is coming down. Yes. And there will be, there's, there's going to be some studies you'll come across of some stevia company funded study. <laughs> okay, that's going to say, no, it doesn't spike it. But, you know, okay, you could get a CGM and do your own experiment. But, you know. I have a CGM on and it doesn't. Perfect. The stevia doesn't spike doesn't me, spike but I'm still cognizant that there must be a physiological response. So I want to know what that is. It's then. the feel-good receptors in the brain. So you're saying it's just the dopamine. So it's basically a dopamine. It's a thalamus response. It's a sweet taste. So it's not going to spike your insulin because you're not getting a glucose spike like sugar. Right. But you still get that sweet taste that you want. Okay. And then you get a cephalic insulin response. Mm -hmm. so what does cephalic mean? So the pancreas is still working down. hard and yes. overworked if you're having too much. Right. Thank you. And I, I mean, I can, I just feel it. You walk in that stupid Walmart and they have them damn cupcakes right there <laughs> at the front, and that smell goes up my nose, and I thought. My insulin just went through the ceiling. Yeah, you know what you do then? You order on the app and they bring it out. That's what car. I've been doing the last yeah. three years. Because I tell people, it, 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 my groceries yeah, it's the best thing is to avoid your trigger spots mm -hmm. at the beginning, right. for sure. That yeah, when you talk butter about cream about, icing gets me every yeah. time. Oh, me too. When you talk about a trigger spot and we're talking about addiction, one of the things I finally realized too is for me, there is something about coming home that I go immediately to the fridge or the cabinet. Yes. And I'm like, oh, yes, thank you. 
Or if I'm traveling, what do I do? I want to eat as soon as I get some in my car. And I eat car. Yeah. We call we call that the we call that the. I think when I came home from school, when I was yeah. 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 hungry. Yeah. We call that sort of like the re, the reentry. So you you've been at a whole different aspect of your day routine, and then now you're it's a reentry into your comfort, comfort zone. Yeah. And comfort to us is food, nourishing, eating. We like to eat. It's fun and. That's that's really what that comes down to. Mine's yeah. after a meal. I get the cravings after a meal. Oh, for sweet? Yes. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm fine before I eat. So I, I was never eat, a I sugar addict. Immediately, okay? I'm but done I've, I was drinking alcohol, okay? And my favorite alcohol is red wine. So I've since given up red wine, I've given up alcohol, but and I was never into dessert. My mother didn't even serve dessert. But now I have like a craving for something sweet because the alcohol isn't in my body anymore. So I'm just asking, like, because I'm just curious, like, is there anything that I can do other than abstain? Yeah, so what I would suggest just, I mean, there's there's a couple different angles to this and I, you could try doing something simple like at that moment when you're craving, let's say it's after the meal, um, make a, a slushy that has the flavored electrolyte powder, but do it very dilute. So you just yeah. get a little twinge of the flavor and it just a slight, like it's kind of very dilute, but yeah. don't go overboard, but you're having like a, an outright icy from the truck from yeah. the old no, days. No, right? I, I bought something like that and it's actually a little chocolatey, a little and a little salty, and I freeze it in ice cube trays and I drink that with with my water and it does satisfy me a little. So that's yeah. a good idea. So and then it's up to you to figure out do you have sober behavior with this? It doesn't trigger you to go buy a package of cookies, right? And yeah. are you satisfied? Okay. And then, you know, to me that's you know well, well worth it for your yeah. your sanity and getting yeah, rid yeah, of your yeah. cravings. Okay. So, yeah, Martha. Thanks. Lisa, can you speak from your experience, long term carnivore experience, what the continued benefits are over the years? Because you get a big, big bunch in the beginning, but what have you learned over the decade and a half? So, what what has really come? What, like to answer that question, the question being, what long-term benefits are there aside from those great, like typical first six to 12 month benefits? What long-term, since I've been doing this so long, a lot of it has to do with, for me, having what we call zero carb zen. We always called it just having, I'm, I'm a very mm -hmm. calm, even keeled <laughs> person. I, I, my feathers do not get ruffled um like and there's there's a lot to be said for mental clarity and for me the beauty of hoping because we don't know but hoping for that it's going to avoid alzheimer's and dementia and mm -hmm. parkinson's and it's going to lead to a healthy productive period of later years because here I'm 58 and I'm still hiking mountains I want to you know I have a lot of things on my my bucket list and I feel like the sky's the limit I can do anything I want to so that positive outlook once you gotten to this point where you know what I'm not on any medications I don't mm -hmm. have any diagnosis mm -hmm. and I'm not plagued with going to the store and buying all my crap and getting to my drug of choice, the DOC, because food is, was definitely, I was never an alcoholic, never a smoker or a drug addict, nothing. But damn, that food addiction was such a strong, strong pull for me. And to finally feel, you know, that I've overcome that. And, you know, and I tell people too, because they, they ask me about the coffee thing. Once, I, I, 10 years ago, I gave up caffeine because I didn't want to be addicted to anything. Once I realized the freedom I had from cravings and addiction and withdrawal and all that, I was like, wow, I don't want to get up and fix myself a coffee every morning. I feel tired because my body's going through a withdrawal from a drug. And
and it is the most widely abused, you know, drug. Um, and people don't realize just like I, you know, sometimes I, I try to just hold it in, but from more and more things that I look into and research and hear that it, it's, it's one of those things where you will start looking at other people drinking coffee and watching them queue up at Starbucks and all clutch in their coffee and go, wow, these people are really yeah. don't realize what that is doing to them. And you're, it's a seed that you're, they're, they're burning, basically crushing it. You're pouring boiling water over it and you're bathing your microbiome over and over in this. And I try to, and, and I get it. I mean, I drank coffee all my life and all the way four years into being a carnivore. So, I mean, I'm not totally not against it, but I tell people if you're not at the spot where you want to be and you're not getting results that you want, you got to do the hard things and see what it's like to give it up for six months and then reevaluate. What do you drink instead? There's so many great things that you can have, like in the morning Rise you can and do mushroom coffee and all that. No, I mean just hot water with a little wedge of lemon in it is is just divine. I always thought that would be the most disgusting thing in the world, but it kind of tastes like herbal tea to me. It's just a beautiful hot water. I know it sounds weird. Um, you can just do hot bone broth. Um, and then I have a video, YouTube again, a YouTube video where I make this thing called um, hot nog, and it's basically put a couple tablespoons of butter in a you know a yeti kind of container thing like yeah. you got there right um boiling water and then i get my frother or my immersion blender and then i dump in one or two raw egg yolks mm -hmm. and it whisks it up to this beautiful nice you know foamy delicious drink you can add a touch of um cinnamon a touch of vanilla extract and it's just divine and that replaces that ritual that you want because you know you, you want to sit and read your emails with your cup of coffee right or whatever it's it's part of it is the ritual and i get it i love gosh i love the aroma i love the taste i still do drink decaf once in a while even though that's not ideal that needs to go from my yellow into the red but it's still in the yellow so when you see me drink your coffee <laughs> decaf here uh, on occasion but yeah, it's it's a process. Do you save the egg whites when you do? Oh yeah, yeah, I do because then I'll use the egg whites yeah. for something yeah, else. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that you can freeze them; they freeze well yeah, too. So we don't throw food away unless Ew. it's bad food, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't ever throw because none of my food goes bad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it just doesn't. I mean, mine bacon either. never goes bad. I don't even <laughs> want to share my food. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I have a question. So this is my day one. I've never done keto, carnivore, or anything. So you need to really like that find a, a functional holistic practitioner um, there are actually websites low card practitioner.com I believe is one the well chat is a good one too well chat the well chat the well chat is another um, and I think on Rivero dr. Sean Baker's site he has a resource of physicians and a lot of them will do telemedicine telehealth so dr. Robert Cyrus is down in Florida but he does video calls he's a great one to review your blood work um, if you're like me what I did was I well fortunately for me I was not having any significant health issues so I have no use for the medical system whatsoever so I don't go to the doctor <laughs> I know, it's kind of crazy but I, it's, it's a wonderful thing well that's the reason for the strategy too that you have a couple of health issues and I'm looking to yeah so you do need somebody to help you right. deep de prescribe it's called right. deprescribing your medications and you need to be you know very diligent about um, having somebody monitor that because you don't want to play around with that. It right. depends on what you're on. If it's thyroid meds, high blood pressure, metformin, all that stuff. Yeah, you want to, but you'll you'll see that over time, your your body, our bodies are here to evolve and heal and be healthy. Our bodies are not going to just go into a disease state for no reason. So, removing all the toxins that we can from food. Obviously, we still have EMF and we've got pollution and you know you can name everything else and stress and all that that affects our health but in general you know once we remove 
all of the inappropriate foods and we start eating optimal human diet, as Dr. Barry says, your body is going to start healing. Now, I always say it's not gonna be fast because you probably have 30, 40, 50 years of eating garbage and it's not gonna remember, you can't say, oh, I have people say, I've been doing this five weeks and I still don't blah, 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 blah. Really? You're 52, so that's five decades versus your five weeks. Do you wanna give yourself a little bit of a fighting chance here and just, you know, and, and embrace the positive things that are happening along the way and just, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing is that you will gradually have no need for the medical system like I did, unless I break a bone or get appendicitis. As I said, those are probably the two things that I would probably make a phone call. Okay, but, I think the other part of my question is, what about supplementation? Because there's so many supplements out there, probiotics, prebiotics, what about anything? Yeah, like that? so I, I, I can only, well, I can give you a couple of different opinions on this, but my main opinion is that the fact that, from my experience, back 14 and a half years ago, we were we did not have LMNT and Redmond's. We didn't have any of this. None of us were down in the electrolytes. I have not taken any electrolytes through this whole thing. Okay? I just don't. Like why would I? And I feel the more magnesium or potassium that I have put in my body, my body has to compensate with the fact that this is coming in. Ooh. Okay, now I have to recognize this. So it's something that has to be dealt with. Now, it's different if you know you have a deficit or you know you, you're in a health state where you really could use some magnesium. Maybe there might be a period of time where it might benefit you, I don't know. But for the most part, like I said, I, I am not a big person on supplements. I think for the most all the supplements, factory made, synthetic, supplements are just that. Your body is using it very differently than if it had come in an oyster or a salmon or a lamb chop. The, the, the nutrient that is in there that they say is in your capsule, I believe is not the same bioavailability and what am I doing? Why am I, why am I doing this? You know, and um, yeah, all the studies and things, you gotta see who's funding them, and a lot of times that's hidden. You can't even see who's funding it. And who's out to make money on this, and, and why? I don't understand the big, huge thing with electrolytes. That's the one thing that really has me kind of perplexed of the insistence, oh, you gotta have electrolytes, oh. But some people say, well, you have to have electrolytes to avoid the keto flu. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Did I have keto flu? Uh, I don't know. You know, might have felt a little lightheaded or low energy for a week or two, yeah. but okay, who cares? My body's adjusting. Why am I quick to have to down something to offset my keto flu? I let my body, I trust my body is going to do what it needs to do and try to get out of its way. And again, by putting things in, your body has to compensate, okay? I, I, I just, I'm, I'm not against people who are using them and say, well, I get leg cramps, so I have to take electrolytes every day. Okay, how long have you been taking them for? Oh, the, really, the past two years. Really, have you tried not taking them and then giving your body a chance to adapt to the fact that you've been putting all of this, you know, all these different things into your body? That's, and, and I really, I like to, I like to pride myself on simplicity. Just the more simple you can make it, it's a whole different story if somebody's got SIRS, somebody's got significant GI issues with significant leaky gut. I mean, there's definitely a place for supplementation under the right testing and the right scenario, but I'm just talking about in general, I feel like that's my, the, the gist of my recommendation is less is more. Is that to use salt? I just salt to taste. I know that's a, a kind of like a question because some of uh, the long-term carnivores do not use salt. Um, and even the bear, um, Owsley Stanley, he um, was a 40-year carnivore and was, um, uh, in his writings, he wrote about no, not using salt. Um, I, I have an, a, an interesting perspective recently on 
a, um, a couple things that I read about salts enhancing the flavor so much of, let's say, meat and eggs, that it drives an overconsumption. And think about if you had just plain scrambled eggs or a plain fried egg, how many would you eat? Okay, like literally. And let's say you have a pound of ground beef, just beautiful, wonderful ground beef that you've salted to taste. I can pretty much pack the pound down. If it is not salted, about a third to a half a pound in, I'm like, okay, I'm done. Right? So there's a different thought process that we could and should also think about that. And I, I'm still... I'm still pondering that issue because it's very interesting to me, especially coming from where I am, where I'm like, yeah, that's a really um, different relationship with food. And I hate to say, well, when you make it totally bland and distasteful, <laughs> but I gotta say, you know, when you get used to not salting and not over salting and all that stuff, the true flavor of the meat is so beautiful and actually very, just very satisfying and in our mind it's bland compared to when we salted it but over time it just becomes a very satisfying delicious um, nutrient meal yeah do you so i struggled at the beginning when i was meat-based with first off i had to learn what it meant to be full and so really listening to my body as i'm eating the meat then there's the idea that you need to have a certain amount of grams of protein per body weight to gain muscle, gain muscle. I mean, so sometimes I'm like, naturally, I may not want to eat, what, 50 grams of protein a day. How do I, what am I listening to? Like, how, I know, the, the, the worst, the worst, especially as somebody new to all this, right. is, is, your eagerness to absorb as much information as you can from every place because you're like wait what did you say wait what did he say well she said what and and it's like you just become ravenous of like all right i gotta i gotta understand how to do this right and unfortunately a lot of that stuff coming in is what conflicting conflicting information right fast don't fast you know fast it's the best thing for you and don't fast is going to ruin your hormones and you know you got there, there's just so many different things you got to have a gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight and then there's others that are oh, you, got, you know all sorts of different messages so it, it really it's it's so individual so when I coach people and I really like talk to them one-on-one -on -one about these things it a lot of it has to do with where you've come from, are you underweight, are you overweight, um, what has been your history with insulin and glucose and all that, and then decide on setting a set starting point and have you measure for a period of time your glucose and your ketones and how you feel, and then you can make decisions going forward based on that. Because I don't want anybody to feel like, oh, there is a set rule, and. You're, you can't be a rule breaker here. You gotta have, because if you're not hungry, you shouldn't be eating, right, right. okay? So that, that's, a, that's a big deal for me. Like I, I so do not like reading in some forum that's out there that says this, is you gotta eat two pounds of meat a day. I'm like, you know what, I'm 5'3". I'm not thinking two pounds is really ideal for me if I wanna get down to my lean fighting weight to get ready for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> so.